Hi everyone, Stan here with some great news. I wanted to put this in at the beginning of the Bible study because uh, I have to record the Bible studies a little earlier. Uh, but I want to let you know some great news. We are reopening. We're going to reopen, not this coming Sunday, the 7th, but the 14th. March 14th, we're going to reopen. So we're, we're grateful that the numbers have gotten back to the point that we feel like we can reopen safely. And so we're going to plan to do that on March 14th. Now, reminder, that is daylight saving time weekend. So that's the, the weekend we set our clocks up on Saturday, so just be aware of that and we'll give you reminders in between now and then. But I just wanted to get this on here as soon as possible to let you know, get word out to people who maybe don't have internet, who you know who would be uh, interested in, in knowing. And uh, because we wanna let people know we're gonna be reopening on March 14th. Uh, don't forget that when we do this, we're going to be uh, making sure, you know, we, we have our mask. Everyone's been good about that so far, and we're, we're grateful for that. We're also going to still be distancing. We've got the place uh, marked off, and uh, so want to let you know that we're not going to be opening the middle sections until the end sections have all been used. So if maybe you were used to getting here, like right when the service started or a little before, a little after, and getting into one of the middle sections. We just wanna let you know that you may be asked to sit closer to the front in an end section uh, because we wanna make sure we keep distance. We're, I think we're in the home stretch with all this. I really believe that and I'm praying that, but we wanna make sure we keep moving in the right direction. So we're, we're gonna we're do everything we can to make sure that that happens. But just wanted to let you know that and we're excited about that. We look forward to seeing you on the 14th. And now here's today's online Bible study. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to our online Bible study. The first week of March. Uh, it's hard to believe that this year is going by so quick. I hope that you're taking advantage of our Lent devotions that we have every day, Monday through Saturday. And uh, those are posted on the website, on our app, on our Facebook page. Uh, we want to help you as you prepare for the Easter season. Uh, and so you can use these in your quiet time each day. We encourage you to do that. Also, don't forget to watch our Wednesday encouragement each week. Uh, any updates that we have regarding events and things like that and when we restart, all that kind of thing will be mentioned there. And so please make sure that you are watching that. And I hope on Sundays you'll join us for our church-wide time of prayer at 930 in the morning. As we join together from our homes or wherever we are, we can still join together in prayer as a church family. And we, we believe that's important. And so we want to invite you to join us in doing that on Sundays. Remember, if you need communion cups or anything like that, uh, please Feel free to come by and get them. Just call the office to make sure somebody's here when you're going to come by. We don't want you to waste a trip. Well, as we begin this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it blesses us and, and teaches us. And I pray, Father, that as we look at your word today, that we would be encouraged and strengthened and that we would grow closer in our walk with you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for your love and care for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to think of a prayer that you have prayed in your life that wasn't answered the way you wanted it to be answered. Now, it's probably not hard to do, is it? Maybe it was praying for a snow day when you were in school or praying for God to make that girl or that guy like you as much as you like them. Maybe it was for help passing a test when you really hadn't studied like you should. Ever been there? You know, Lord, please let him only ask about the things I remember. <laughs> I've been there. Or maybe it was about getting into a particular college or getting a particular job. Maybe you prayed to get a promotion or a transfer that didn't come. Maybe you prayed for children and that never happened. Sometimes we pray for something and it's not answered the way we want it, and we never really understand why. 
Have you ever prayed for something and had it answered differently than the way you wanted it answered? Or at least maybe greatly delayed from when you wanted it answered? But then after that, maybe you saw that God's way was a better way. When I was in ninth grade, we had moved to Roanoke from Harrisonburg. I was not happy in Harrisonburg, but in Roanoke, man, I was playing ball and the popular guys were playing ball. It was ninth grade, which is a critical time for a teenager. And I'm in a new school, but I'm fitting in where I never felt like I fit in in the school I was at before. And so it, everything was just going great. And then my dad comes in and says, you know, the company is downsizing and I either have to find a new job or I have to take a transfer if that's offered. And uh, it turned out we, he got transferred to Richmond. And I was so unhappy. I mean, I had been ready to bolt as soon as he told us we were moving to Roanoke. But now, oh, I, I didn't want to go. I thought it was the worst thing. And I prayed, I had prayed that somehow or another he'd get to stay in Roanoke because it worked so well for me. It was, it was going so great for me. And God didn't answer my prayer the way I want. In fact, he said no. And we got to Richmond, and I didn't like it at first. But at church, we found, uh, we found a church with a youth group, and I connected with the kids in the youth group, and it was a good, solid youth group. And those Kids in the youth group became my best friends. And even today, all these years later, when something goes on in our life and, and uh, several of them have been through some diff really difficult times, we've all come together and, and we're there for each other when we need it. We may not touch base for a long period of time, but whenever someone needs the other one, we're always there. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a special relationship we have because of uh, that that friendship and God answered my prayer in a way that was different from what I asked, but it ended up being so much better. And I'm sure most of you have had times like that yourself. Well, Elizabeth and Zachariah had prayed for a child for years, only to be turned down. But in his time, God brought them a son. And the way he did it did more for the kingdom than it could have otherwise. And it blessed them in ways that a conventional pregnancy and birth couldn't have. So we're in Luke, Luke chapter 1. We're going to start reading with verse 57. Verse 57 of Luke 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. Now, the birth of Elizabeth's baby was an anticipated event because of all the circumstances surrounding it. I mean, the angelic announcement, uh, Zachariah's death, mute condition, all that. And there was probably some concern for Elizabeth's safety as childbirth for a woman her age was dangerous. But once everyone is known to be healthy, everybody celebrated with them. And here's the first small way that the angel's promise was fulfilled. Elizabeth and Zachariah's neighbors and relatives shared her joy when the baby was born. His ministry would bring even greater joy to people as he prepared the way for the Messiah and prepared their hearts to receive him. But this is kind of a down payment on that promise. You know, there are always going to be situations we're going to face where we're not going to have prayers answered the way we want them to be or in the time frame we want them to be. And sometimes we're not even going to understand why. But when we look at the Bible and we see how God always has what's best for everyone in mind, that should provide us with a reason to trust him, even if we never really understand why he's answered them the way he has. Verse 59 goes on, On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. Now, it was the custom for Jewish boys when they're eight days old uh, to go and have them circumcised. So that's what Elizabeth does. 
I've always believed that when God gives a command, there's a good reason for it. And I learned while I was helping a fellow research a book that vitamin K, which is helpful in allowing blood to clot, is at its highest point in a baby's life on the eighth day after birth. Just kind of an interesting insight into wh why God uh, may have put boys circumcision on the eighth day when their blood would clot the best. And that's also when the child was to be named on the eighth day. How many of you have an interesting story of why their name is what it is? This is where I really miss being in person because I like hearing your answers to questions. My name is Stanley for one major reason and one minor reason. My grandfather had a brother named Stanley who was killed in a car wreck when he was a teenager. So primarily it was to honor him. My other grandfather had been a baseball player and his all-time favorite player was Stan Musial. Even though I go by Stan, I'm glad they chose Stanley over Stanislaus, which is what Musial's actual full name was. I still have people from time to time call me Stosh because that's a common nickname for Stanislaus. I'd like to say that my kids' names have special meaning outside of Brett's middle name being a family name, but they're the only names we could agree on. I mean, it's murder being married to a teacher. Every time I'd come up with a name, she'd say, oh no, I had a kid with that name who was a brat. I'd think of him every time I heard it. <coughs> I finally had to have her make a list of acceptable names, and I chose from that list. It was murder, because it was a short list. Well, the people expected the baby's name to be Zachariah after his father, because that was the custom at the time. But Elizabeth jumped in and said, no, 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 his name's going to be John. And the people didn't understand it because nobody in their family had had that name. So they started gesturing to Zechariah to see what he wanted to name it. And this verse, along with the angel's announcement that Zechariah would live in silence, are what lead us to think that Zechariah was probably deaf, struck deaf as well as mute. You wouldn't think people would try to sign to him if, if he could hear. Although I've heard people whisper around a deaf person before, and I've heard people talk louder around a blind person, so sometimes people do that. Greg Allen is a worship leader who had polyps on his vocal cords and he wasn't able to speak for several months. And he says that when he couldn't talk, people would start to shout at him and he would write notes on his little notepad that he couldn't speak and people would grab the notepad and start writing him notes. And he'd take the pad back and say, no, I can hear, I just can't speak. So sometimes people do those kinds of things, but the logical assumption is that he had been struck deaf as well as mute. Well, they make signs asking him, you know, what do you want to name the child? So let's go to verse 63. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So they signed to him asking, you know, what do you want the name to be? And he still doesn't speak. So he gets a writing tablet, which at the time was probably a small wooden board covered with some kind of reusable wax film that you could write on. And he wrote that his name would be John which probably started the rumor mill churning because you know how people get. And immediately when he wrote his name was John, his mouth was open and he could speak. And we assume he could hear too if, if he couldn't before. When he finally could speak, what did he say? Well, he praised God. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure praises would have been the first words out of my mouth. It wouldn't have been anything dirty, but... I don't think my first reaction would have been praise. I would have been more tempted to complain. But Zechariah was different. And it says that the neighbors were filled with awe because he could suddenly speak. And we presume if he was deaf, he could hear. This was something that was definitely supernatural. And it made them wonder what God was going to do with this child because it was obvious that God was working in his life already. So let's go to verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, 
Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. <coughs> Excuse me. So what kind of things did Zechariah praise God for? Well, he prayed for redemption of his people, Israel, uh, salvation from sin, uh, and as a people from their enemies. Verse 72 says, To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the earth he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Zechariah is talking about God's covenant with Abraham here and how that rate relates to the Messiah who would be born. Jesus would fulfill all these, but differently than people expected. Zechariah prophesies the completion of the promises made to their forefathers and that they would be able to, to serve God without fear. So how did Jesus show God's mercy to us? Well, he provided a means of salvation when we deserve just the opposite from one. Now, Zechariah was prophesying about Israel being rescued from their enemies. Uh, and they're not the only ones. We're rescued from our enemies because of Jesus. Satan can't win because of Christ. We have forgiveness. We have eternal life. We don't have to fear in, live in fear of losing our relationship to God. Verse 76 says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of, of, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, or in the spirit, you can, you can translate it either way. And he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So Zechariah says that John's mission is going to be to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, what would that involve? Well, preparing the way is a phrase that pictures someone going before the king's chariot and filling in the potholes and getting the rocks out of the road. Back then, whenever a king traveled, there were guys who went ahead of the chariot or the carriage and made sure that all the potholes were filled in. All the rocks were tossed aside. Sometimes they even dug out new areas of the road to straighten curves or flatten small hills. In other words, he's making it possible for him to have better passage. Now, in John's case, he was sent to prepare people's hearts to hear Jesus' message and be ready for the arrival of the Messiah by preaching repentance. Being ready to repent is a big part of having your heart prepared for Jesus. He's going to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's a different way of looking at things for the Israelites. <coughs> Excuse me. They were used to a system of law where they were required to follow a set of rules, and the priest would roll back sin every year through sacrifices. But now they were going to be able to repent and be forgiven and experience real salvation. And they had to be prepared to hear that message from Jesus. It says his calls for repentance will show God's tender mercy. Sometimes we have the image of someone telling people to repent as them shouting red-faced at them and pointing a finger. I, I've seen that done. But he's emphasizing that salvation is from God's mercy. And repentance is an opportunity for us to experience God's mercy. Instead of something we have to be coerced to do, it's like, light coming to our dark world, and, and life springing from death. Now, the last verse covers 30 years. The word appeared here could be translated commissioned, or pointed out, shown forth, or, or even inaugurated. It was used for a public announcement of an official nomination. Now, at some point, John's parents died, and he went to live in the desert to prepare for his mission. These were uneasy times for both Mary and John's parents leading up to this. And I think there were, there were two basic lessons the Lord's giving us 
even though we don't see an angel just like he did to, to Zechariah and Mary. The first is that we need to trust that God will fulfill his promises. So don't be afraid. I'm going to fulfill my promise in you. We can get so nervous about the things we face, health problems, financial problems, job stress, school pressures, family differences, our children's spiritual condition. There are so many things that concern us. But do you know how many times in the Bible we're told not to be afraid that God is going to be with us? 366 times the Bible says, do not fear. Somebody I read once suggested God gave us one for each day of the year and a spare for when we were especially scared. Scripture says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Nineteen times the Bible tells us to be courageous or to be of good courage. Joshua 1.9 is an example. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that's a specific promise to, to Joshua there. But that sentiment that God is with us and that we don't need to be afraid when we have him by our side, that holds true no matter what. So many times we're told, don't worry, do not be anxious. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, each time we're told not to fear, not to worry, not to be afraid, the reason is the same each time. God will be with you. He will fulfill his promises. Zechariah couldn't speak for nine months. Mary faced ridicule from those who didn't understand her circumstances for a long time. So there are problems. There are times of uncertainty. But he promises that he'll go with us. And in the end, he promises that all things will work together for good. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of Christ. That he'll provide a way of escape. He'll sustain us. He'll be our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. And he'll raise us one day from the dead. Ralph Stockman tells of taking his son to New York City for the first time. It's a busy street, kind of a dangerous area. And for several blocks, his son clutched his finger. And finally, his son said, Daddy, I'm getting tired. I don't think I'm going to be able to hold on anymore. You're going to have to hold on to me. And God promises that when we can't hold on any longer, he will hold on to us. It's how we can say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. But there's a second lesson here, and that's to be patient, because God's timing is perfect. Verse 20 says, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. If you have your Bible out, circle the phrase, at their proper time. Sometimes we believe God will fulfill his promises, but we don't understand why he doesn't fulfill them right now. But God's timing is perfect. The Jews have been waiting for their Messiah for hundreds of years. And in the 400 years before Jesus' birth, God was silent. No prophets, no words from God. The Israelites had to be wondering if God had just forgotten or had given up. But God was working, and his timing was perfect. Under Alexander the Great, hundreds of years before, the Greeks had conquered the world and established Greek as a common language. Koine Greek was becoming a common language among different cultures, which made communication of the gospel a lot easier. The Greeks also translated the Old Testament into Greek, and so more people had had the chance to hear the word of God and read it and understand it so as to be prepared for the arrival of the Messiah. When the Romans defeated the Greeks in 63 BC, they put the known world at the time under their thumb, and that especially hurt the Israelites. Because of the Romans, they were spread throughout the known world. But that meant that the people of God were creating a place for the gospel to take root throughout the world. One of the other things it did was it established a universal peace so the message of Christ could be spread 
without the destruction of war. And that peace led to other things. For the first time in history, there were networks of roads and sea routes in the Roman Empire that allowed the gospel to spread more quickly. The timing for Christ's birth was perfect. The timing for Christ's death was perfect. Romans 5 says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And we have to trust that if we've given God the reins of our life, that his timing is perfect. And that means that we need to be patient and we need to trust that God will do what's best. Some years ago, a public high school teacher sent a letter telling about her students' response to an exercise that she had. She asked them, who are the six top people you would like to be stranded with on a desert island? And naturally, they talked about celebrities and beautiful women. And she tried to get them to think about survival and who might help catch and prepare food. So they named Dave from Wendy's. Alex from Kroger, Crocodile Dundee, and the professor from Gilligan's Island, they made the list. When she reminded them of shelter, they had no house to, uh, that they had no house to live in, the students tossed out various ideas until one student gave an idea that changed the whole atmosphere of the class. He said, I'd put Jesus Christ on that list. He was a carpenter. Another student said, yeah, and if we got sick, Jesus could heal us. He could be our doctor. Another student said, you know what, if we had Jesus on the list, he could perform miracles and we wouldn't need anyone else. And Jesus Christ is all you need, frankly, in life and in death. Regardless of what times of uncertainty life brings, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. If Jesus Christ is leading your life, you don't need to be afraid and you don't need to worry. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you're all we really need. And Lord, we're glad that you've given us so much more than what we, just what we need. But we thank you for the fact that even if we lost everything else, that you would be all we need. And for being there with us, we're grateful. Lord, I just ask that you would help us this week to share that good news with those around us so that they might know that joy and that hope and that peace that we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week. Hope to see you in the, in the Wednesday encouragement tomorrow and then Sunday for worship and back again here next week. God bless.